Good evening, everyone, and welcome. I'm Gloria Palmer, the Executive Director of Green Mountain Academy for Lifelong Learning, and I want to thank you all for being here. Today's uh, presenter is Alex Kershaw. He is a journalist and a New York Times bestselling author of books on World War II. Born in York, England, he is the graduate of Oxford University and lives in Savannah, Georgia. His critically acclaimed books include The Bedford Boys, The Longest Winter, and Escape from the Deep. He is the author of The Liberator, which was made into a drama series on Netflix last year. He was also our first Zoom lecture uh, last year and uh, certainly gave me the confidence that we could move ahead and uh, we've been Zooming ever since. So Alex, thank you so much for being our guest tonight. Good to be with you. <clears throat> Can you all hear me okay? Yeah. Good. Um, well, I'm, <clears throat> I'm talking to you from um, not so sunny Florida, but it has been very sunny. Um, so I, I hope you guys are all enduring uh, the Vermont winter. Um, I hope everyone's well. I have to say that this is, I'm going to embarrass Gloria now by saying that this is my uh, 25th wedding anniversary today. And so 25 years ago, a couple of hours ago, um, I got married in the, on the second floor of the Treasure Island Hotel in Las Vegas. Um, no, no one's laughing, you're not smiling now. <laughs> the entry song was, you got to choose two songs, Viva Las Vegas was the one I went into and I, I can't remember um, what I walked out to as a married man, but anyway, um, it's good to be with you. Um, so I'm gonna to talk to you about um, The Liberator, which is a book that came out in 2012 and was um, a, made into a Netflix drama series, actually a, um, an animated series that came out in uh, November, on um, the 11th of November. And um, I'm gonna take you whip through quickly some images, et cetera, and, and tell you the story of Felix Sparks, a really remarkable member of the greatest generation. Um, I interviewed him for a couple of days before he died um, in 2008. And my book is the, his story um, during the Second World War. He was the commanding officer of the first Americans to liberate the longest standing concentration camp in Nazi Germany, which was Dachau. And he did that on the 29th of April, 1945. And that was around his 500th day of combat. Um, the reason why I called the book The Liberator was because someone else had stolen the title. Um, they were publishing a book around the same time as me and um, uh, someone else had, had come up with the idea of naming their book 500 Days. So at the last minute, I had to change my title to The Liberator. Um, but the point was that the original title was about 500 days of combat. And uh, Sparks, Felix Sparks, began to liberate Europe on the very first day that Americans started to fight and die to liberate Europe, which was the 10th of July, 1943 in Sicily, and then participated in four amphibious invasions. And by uh, almost, uh, almost two years later, found himself at the gates of Dachau. So I'm gonna show you a few images now, bear with me. Um, yeah, so this is uh, Felix Sparks, very handsome guy, I think, and his really beautiful wife, Mary. I knew her better than him because he was very ill when I interviewed him. He was sort of 89 years old and on his deathbed. Um, but he was born in Texas um, and grew up in a mining town, a very uh, poverty-stricken mining town at the height of the Depression in Arizona, Miami, Arizona. A lot of his uh, peers at high school were um, first and second generation um, Hispanic immigrants and couldn't speak very, very good English. Some of them couldn't speak English at all, in fact, he told me. He was a very smart guy, um, graduated from his high school, top of his class, as the high school valedictorian uh, in 1934, I believe. Um, and his father had lost his job in a local mine and um, the family didn't have any money at all, certainly not enough to send him to college, which is what he wanted to do. He wanted to go to college and become a lawyer. And so one day in 1934, um, his father told him that um, unfortunately they couldn't feed him. Um, Sparks said to somebody else, not me, but said that that was one of the most 
um, profoundly disturbing moments in his life when his father looked him in the eye and said, "We, you have to leave home because we can't feed you. They were literally that poor. Um, you're going to have to go and find a job. So his mom sewed a secret pocket into a pair of jeans and they collected, I think it was $19, and they put it in the secret pocket. And then his father took him down to the local railroad um, tracks and he became a hobo at 18 um, and rode across America to the, um, to the Gulf Coast and then went all the way back across, across the Rockies and spent a couple of years um, as a hobo, literally, um, you know, with those very large armies of the unemployed that crisscrossed America on the, the tracks in the 1930s. And he was in San Francisco sleeping rough on Market Street. An awful lot of people still sleep rough in, in San Francisco. But he was walking along Market Street and he um, passed an army recruiter. And the recruiter said, hey, bud, you know, you want to join the army and Sparks... Um, had, had no desire to join the army uh, in 1936 anyway and walked on by and then he thought to himself you know if I join the army I'll get three square meals a day I'll, I'll be warm I'll, I'll, I'll have some kind of income and so he went back took a token from the recruiter and the, the token allowed him to take a streetcar across San Francisco and he, then he went to Angel Island uh, which was then a recruiting station and in 19... 36, he joined the, uh, joined the US Army. And unbelievably, back then in the 1930s, when you joined the US Army, you were often given a choice of where you wanted to serve. And he said that um, his first choice um, was Hawaii. I mean, why not, why not go to Hawaii and, and spend a couple of years in the Army rather than somewhere else? So he found himself um, on a ship headed to Hawaii. And he said that he crossed through the Golden Gate Straits and the Golden Great Bridge was about half constructed. And by the time he came back to the US in 1938, he passed under the completed uh, Golden Gate Bridge. Um, so then he went to, he saved up enough money to go to law, to go to college. He went to the University of Arizona. Um, this, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Yes. And um, he uh, was in his uh, third year at college, um, when Pearl Harbor uh, was attacked and he, because he'd been in the army before um, the attack on Pearl Harbor, everybody that had been an officer or been in the regular army was recalled very quickly. And he became a, a junior officer, a lieutenant in E Company of the 157th Infantry Regiment of the 45th Infantry Division. Uh, now this is a picture um, here of Thunderbirds, the, the nickname for the division was the Thunderbird Division. And if you look really closely on their shoulder, shoulder patches, you'll see there's an image of the Thunderbird. Um, unbelievably, up until the early 1930s, until the rise of Adolf Hitler, um, the patch on their shoulders was actually a swastika. Um, and people thought it might not be a very good idea to have a swastika on your shoulder if you went to war against Nazis. Um, so they replaced the swastika with the Thunderbird. And this is uh, a group of Thunderbirds, and they are uh, midway across the Atlantic uh, in 1943, and they are headed towards their, toward their first action, which was in Sicily um, on the 10th of July, 1943. Uh, the invasion of Sicily um, was the largest and previous invasion uh, of the war to that day. Um, in fact, in terms of men, it was actually larger than D-Day, 6th of June, 1943. 44, there were over 225,000 Allied troops that stormed the shores of southern Italy on the 10th of July, 1943. Um, this is a Sparks' pistol, a, a Colt 45, and you'll see that on the grip, um, that's a piece of perspex there, uh, actually taken from the windshield of a downed B-17 bomber. And under the, um, the GI said it's a lot, um, they took the grips and they replaced them and put, uh, put uh, photographs of their loved ones. And this is Mary Sparks here on, uh, on the grip of um, her husband's pistol. Um, they were married um, just three months before, four months before Pearl Harbor. And by the time he had um, crossed Sicily in July and early August of 1943, she had given birth to their first child. 
when he left her, she was so pregnant, he told me that um, when, she, when he embraced her, her stomach, he, literally, he, she was, he was like this because she was almost eight months pregnant. Um, but he never got to see his child. And uh, the, um, she would all the way through the campaign in Sicily and then further on in Italy, she would send photographs and postcards. And this is one of the photographs that she sent to him. And he placed it under the, the butt of his pistol. Um, so that's the cover of the book. This is a, a really um, beautiful photograph that we took from Robert Kappa, the great life photographer. And that's actually of a soldier. I think it, I believe it's a soldier in the, in the first division, the big red one. And that's actually taken in Sicily. And so that gives you an idea of the kind of the atmospherics and the landscape that Sparks was fighting in during World War II. Um, so I will speed up a little bit now. Um, Sparks um, was a lieutenant in E Company when uh, the invasion of Sicily occurred. And by the end of it, he told his commanding officer that he didn't want to be uh, an executive officer. He was the executive officer for E Company. He didn't want to carry out uh, administrative duties. He didn't want to fill out paperwork and make medal recommendations and, and basically be a, a pen pusher. He wanted to be a combat leader and he got his wish. So for the second uh, amphibious invasion that he was involved in, which was the uh, invasion of Southern Italy, um, that's the Salerno invasion in September of 1943, he actually became E Company commander um, and actually was a, a, a combat commander. Uh, I'll now find a few more photographs and we'll move on. This is, a, you'll see the Thunderbird patch here um, on the shoulder here. It's a really nice photograph. I met this guy and he's extraordinary. You can see if you look really carefully that there's a, a Medal of Honor uh, dangling around his, his um, throat, that beautiful light blue ribbon, which you can't see in black and white, but it's beautiful. Um, Thunderbird patch, as I said, and this is uh, Van Barfoot. He is one of uh, three Native Americans who received the Medal of Honor while serving with the Thunderbird Division. And those of you who know about Native American culture, in fact, in many cultures, the uh, Thunderbird is a very symbolic image. Um, what I should say about the uh, 45th Injured Division before I go any further is that it had the largest number of Native Americans serving in that division, more, far more than any other US division in World War II. So out of around about 14,000 guys in the full combat strength division, more than 1,500 were Native Americans, and they came from over, over 30 different tribes, mostly drawn from the Southwest. So it's Colorado, New Mexico, um, Oklahoma, parts of Texas. Um, so the, the Van Barfoot, who you're looking at here, received the Medal of Honor um, during the breakout. Um, he received it in the September 1944, but he, his actions were in the breakout from the Battle of Anzio in May of 1944. Um, and what I should say is that for him, uh, I, I sat next to him about 15 years ago at a, at a um, oops, sorry, at a, uh, a, a reunion of the division. And he was a quite an intimidating guy. He was uh, definitely a, a, a warrior, very uh, fearsome guy, even when he was in his 80s. Um, and he knew Sparks pretty well. Um, they, they fought together in the same regiment, the 157th Infantry Regiment. And I want to stress that the Thunderbird to him was a very important symbol because for the Native Americans fighting to liberate Europe, it was uh, the, the, the symbol was a harbinger um, of hope and freedom and, um, and good fortune for those who were good, who were deserving. And it was the harbinger of revenge and death and destruction for those who were evil. Um, so it's very apposite, very um, symbolic image to have on your shoulder as an American liberator during World War II. Uh, that's a picture of uh, several German graves that was taken in the fall of 1943. So um, just, to, just to take you through uh, a, a few chapters of the war pretty quickly, Sparks um, fought at Salerno during the um, second amphibious invasion of the war, as I mentioned. He was badly wounded uh, by friendly fire in October of 1943 in the Apennines in southern Italy. 
um, taken off the line, went to a hospital in North Africa, went AWOL from the hospital, disobeyed orders, uh, hitched a ride back to Italy on a B-17 bomber, and then rejoined his uh, regiment in December of 1943 near the winter line in, uh, in Italy, um, and was allowed, unbelievably, was allowed to go back and uh, assume control, resume control rather, of E Company of the 157th Infantry Regiment. His third amphibious invasion was the uh, invasion of Anzio, that's about 70 miles south of Rome in January of 1944. Um, very few casualties during that invasion. Um, one division, I think there were only 26 Americans killed that day, 22nd of January 1944, um, during the invasion of, of uh, Anzio. But it became a very bloody stalemate that lasted um, for over four months. The Allies finally broke out of the Anzio bridgehead in late May of 1944 and was stuck on a plane literally beneath German guns for four very, very long months. Um, the Germans tried to push the Allies back into the sea. There were several very fierce counterattacks by the Germans. And in one, and in one battle, from around the 16th of February, 1944, for about 10 days, um, E Company, Sparks' E Company of the 157th Infantry Regiment were surrounded by the Germans and suffered very, very high casualties indeed. In fact, during that 10 day battle, um, all of Sparks' company, E Company, fought from a series of man-made caves on the Anzio plane. And he and one other man from his company of around 200 guys, they were the only two men to survive that battle, uh, that critical battle um, during the Anzio campaign. Um, Sparks managed to get back to his own lines and a supply sergeant called Leon Sear also managed to get back to American lines. So that made just two from a company at full strength of 200 that managed to survive that very, very fierce, intense engagement. Um, all of the other guys in Sparks' uh, company, he was the company commander. You can imagine how he felt having uh, to deal with the, uh, the news that he was the only one, but uh, only one of two men to survive that battle. Uh, everybody else was either killed, wounded, or captured. Um, so I think I don't, there you have him here. He's on the far left there, and that's in Naples. Um, I interviewed a, a good friend of his um, when I was researching the book, and he said that Sparks, um, broke down one night in a bar in Naples and was absolutely traumatized and in tears, saying that he you know, just didn't know how he would ever be able to live with himself, how he'd be able to get over the survivor's guilt of being in command at, you know, just 25 years old, I should say, but in command of 200 guys. And to lose almost every one of those guys uh, was a, a, a terrific blow. It was something that uh, when I interviewed him, him myself, he said that he never recovered from. It was something that was very just broke his heart. He was very, very, uh, very upset about that, that loss of those young men's, men's lives. Um, so I'm going to move on fast now and to show you a few more pictures so we can get move towards the climactic chapters of the war. After that, he broke out from Anzio with the Allies. Uh, they took Rome. Rome fell on the uh, 4th of June, 19. 44, it was the first Axis city to fall to the Allies um, in, in Europe. Uh, but unfortunately, the accomplishment was only in the headlines for less than 48 hours, because on the 6th of June, 1944, we have D-Day, the one and only D-Day. When people think about the war in Europe, those people who know a fair bit about it know that there were several D-Days. In fact, Sparks was involved in four. Um, there were actually six in the European theatre. But most people, when, they, when you say to them D-Day, they immediately think of the 6th of June, 1944. So the very long, uh, bloody march from the shores of Sicily all the way to Rome that lasted um, almost a year, that was basically forgotten um, because all the glory was grabbed by the 29th Division, the 101st Airborne, the Screaming Eagles, etc., on D-Day, 6th of June. But um, that was a, a very, a very uh, notable accomplishment by the US Army and the Allies was to, uh, to, to, to take Rome on the 4th of June, 1944. Uh, 15th of August, speeding up, 15th of August, 1944, Sparks was involved in his last fourth amphibious invasion, 
which was called Operation Dragoon, which is actually the most successful operation, amphibious operation of World War II. Very, very effective supporting fire, um, really well planned. Uh, the Allies had learned by the 15th of August 1944 how to conduct a amphibious inv invasion. Uh, they put a hell of a lot of men ashore. They had very, very good air support and incredible artillery fire support, supporting them and, and enormous quantities of, of uh, artillery shells being fired from out by the U US and, and uh, British and Canadian navies, etc. cetera. Um, Sparks and his units uh, marched up through the Rhone Valley, uh, past some of the most beautiful uh, vineyards, some of the, which makes to this day some of the best wine in the world. Uh, and then they found themselves in the Vosges Mountains in the late fall of 1944. The Vosges Mountains are just uh, on the border of Germany um, in Alsace-Lorraine. And this is a photograph of Thunderbirds going house to house, clearing out snipers uh, in a village in, in Alsace. Um, and this is, I think, November 1944. Uh, there you have another picture that's uh, of the Thunderbirds on the march. You'll see that the enormous damage done to all the buildings. Um, the approach that the Americans had by this stage of the war was that if you uh, surrendered, if you flew white flags and uh, took your tablecloths, anything white and, and dangled them from windows, etc., and you, you surrendered, then all well and good. But if you didn't, they would just literally destroy any village, any town. And then by the end of the war, you know, most of uh, German, Germany's major cities had been either bombed to, to smithereens or shelled to, to pieces. But this is a, a picture of the uh, Thunderbirds on the march in early December of 1944. Uh, that's a picture of um, what war is really about. I've never been to war. I never want to go to war. Um, I can't imagine how, how unbelievably traumatic it would be to spend even a day dealing with this kind of situation. Um, for the book, I interviewed a couple of medics um, who uh, were not, not in this picture, but this shows you a wounded Thunderbird um, being treated by his fellow soldiers. And if you look at the top of the picture, I think I find this quite moving, actually, um, actually very moving. Um, number one, you'll notice how skinny the, the, the troops are, how thin that guy's legs are. And that's because they literally had, uh, had hardly any, any fat on their bodies at all. When they got undressed and went into showers, uh, their bodies were marble. They were almost rock solid with muscle and very, very slim. And that's because they lost a lot of body weight. They had had uh, deficient diets in the 30s anyway. But in combat, the stress meant that they lost a lot of weight very quickly and, and literally became you know, undernourished, that you'll see how thin his leg is. But look to the top of the picture. I don't want to ramble on too much, but you'll see that he's in an enormous amount of pain and he's gripping, uh, one of the medics is gripping this guy's hand as he's been uh, treated for what looked like, what looks like either a mortar or, or a 88 millimeter shell wound. Um, from the 157th Infantry Regiment, that Sparks belonged to. There were over 1,500 Americans killed. Uh, but I think what will give you a picture of the, the level of attrition and the, the, um, the, uh, the, the sheer fatality of being involved in, in this kind of combat would be that uh, a junior officer, a lieutenant, uh, going up to a captain, a captain would usually be a company commander, a, a, a company would have maybe uh, four lieutenants, but a lieutenant um, in combat would last no longer than maybe a month or two. If you lasted three months, that was on the line without being killed or wounded. That was really, really very fortunate indeed. Um, company commanders, again, um, just a few weeks sometimes. In Normandy, it was the turnover was absolutely astonishing. Some, some guys, some companies would have a new company commander every three or four days. Um, the turnover of the Thunderbird division itself was over 300%. So that means of 14,000 guys, you went through 14,000 guys three times by, by the end of the war. Very, very, very intense combat and very, very low likelihood of being able to make it to the end of the war without being psychologically um, irreparably damaged, seriously wounded or killed. Um, Sparks himself, the liberator, was wounded badly twice, um, so, but he did actually obviously, obviously survive, but 
he was one of the very, very few guys that went all the way through the liberation of Europe from day one to the very end. Um, this is a picture of, of um, that you would see um, very often in, in Germany in the um, early months of 1945. Um, in February, March and April of 1945, the German army lost over 300,000 men in each of those months. So that's almost a million men um, killed uh, in the last three months of the war. We destroyed 70% of, of German uh, industrial base. Um, we made over 900,000 Germans homeless. Uh, we killed uh, well over, actually, two days ago on the 30, three days ago on the 13th of February, um, 1945, uh, we bombed Dresden and, and some people believe that we killed over 30,000 German civilians in one night. The point of this picture is it shows you the level of, of destruction and the sort of abject, uh, abject nature of the war towards the end. These are German children playing with discarded weapons uh, left behind. And this, you, this is an image that you'd see in German villages and towns uh, as the Allies liberated uh, Nazi Germany from, from Nazism. Um, I should add that Sparks in January of 1945 was a battalion commander. He, he told me that it wasn't hard to get promoted in World War II. All he had to do was survive. But actually, he was being quite modest because he was very rapidly promoted. He went from being a lieutenant to a lieutenant colonel in about a year, which is an astonishing progression. Um, although not that unusual, if you, if you were very talented and you could get things done, if you could achieve, achieve objectives with minimum ca minimum casualties, you were often promoted. Um, and that was the case with Sparks. And in January 1945, he was a battalion commander. That's around 800 guys under his command. He found himself in a village not too dissimilar to the one that you're looking at here, uh, Reipersweiler, just on the German border. His uh, battalion was surrounded in very bitter winter conditions, just like you're looking at out your windows um, as the light fades now or has faded in Vermont, bitterly cold. And his battalion was surrounded by the Waffen SS, not the SS that controlled the concentration camps, that's a different part of the SS but it was uh, surrounded by the 6th SS. They were veterans of the war in Finland against the, uh, the Red Army. They were very, very good, good at winter warfare. And unbelievably, again, uh, almost all of his battalion, his command were, was wiped out. Uh, he had from, 200, from 800 guys, more than 200 were killed and all but two guys from his battalion, unbelievably, just like at Anzio, uh, were taken prisoner uh, killed or wounded. So for the second time in World War II, the entire command had been virtually wiped out. Um, and again, Sparks, you can only imagine he's now 26 years old and for the second time in less than a year, almost all the guys that he's responsible for is very, often very young Americans, 18, 19. Let's not forget by 1945, you, you know, guys were not even finishing high school. They, they weren't allowed to, you turned 18 and you were, you were drafted. You were in the front line sometimes three months later. Some of the replacements coming into these units, Sparks' units certainly for Riper's Viola in the last months of the war, that didn't even know how to ha handle the rifle properly. Uh, none of them had killed before, obviously, well, if, unless they were <laughs> career criminals, but they, they'd never seen combat. They didn't know what it was like to be fired upon. They didn't know what it was like to, to act uh, in these conditions, they were very, very uh, underprepared indeed. So um, Sparks moved on into Germany. We crossed the Rhine in uh, March of 1945 at Remagen. Um, he crossed it on, I think it was the, uh, Remagen was the 9th of March, 1945. The Rhine was the last great natural barrier between uh, the Allies and uh, all of Germany. Um, and he crossed uh, south of Remagen. It's about uh, 150 miles south of Remagen, uh, near Worms, a city called Worms, uh, which is actually where General Patton with the Third Army, he also crossed there. Um, still a battalion commander. He fought very hard in a city that probably most people listening have never heard of. This was April, late March, early April of 1945. It was a city called Alschaffenburg. And um, unbelievably, this, we're only weeks away from the end of the war, literally three weeks away from the end of the war. 
um, his, his unit are suffering really high casualties because the Germans refused to give up. Um, they fought ferociously in many areas of Germany right to the very bitter end, even though it was hopeless, even though it was very clear to both the Germans and us, obviously, that the, the war was basically going to end soon and it was a, a hopeless cause. They were so indoctrinated, they were so, so afraid of not fighting, they were so uh, terrorized uh, and uh, that they, they fought viciously, um, very, very, in some cases, right to the 7th of May when the war ended. Um, this image here um, is, shows Felix Sparks. Um, he's, again, look at his uh, frame. He, is, um, he told me that he lost, in the last uh, two months of the war, he lost 40 pounds. And that uh, shows you the, uh, the level of stress uh, that he's under. This is taken in, uh, it's a very controversial photograph. Um, it shows Sparks um, firing his pistol. Uh, those of us, those of you who are still with me from earlier on, if, if, I'm glad you still are, but um, the pistol is the one that I showed you earlier on and under the, uh, he's, so his hand is actually over the image of his beautiful young wife, Mary, who he hasn't seen in over two years. Um, and what he's doing there is he's raising his pistol, he's fired it and he's thrusting out his hand and he's uh, shouting out um, in a few seconds anyway, stop. And what he's doing is he's stopping his men from massacring SS Waffen SS soldiers who had been lined up against the wall that you can see in the background. Now, this is the coal yard in Dachau. It's, this is photographs taken on the 29th of April, 1945. It's around about 10, 11 o'clock in the morning. Um, Sparks uh, was given a, a, a very important job towards the end of the war, and that was to lead a task force. It was called Task Force Sparks. And his job was to barrel down past Munich into the Tyrol and go to Berchtesgaden and try and capture Adolf Hitler. And so he had a, several reporters following his unit because that would be the, the really big story of the war would be to get a photograph of, obviously, or a, a report, a story about the capture of, of, of Hitler himself. Uh, but on the, early on the morning of the 29th of April, uh, Sparks received an order which really annoyed him. He said that he was very, very upset by this order. It was around eight o'clock in the morning. And the order was that he should make a diversion away from Munich to a, a place called Dachau. It's about 15 miles north of Munich. And he, he'd never heard of Dachau. He didn't, he didn't know what, what, why he was going there, what he would find there. Um, on the outskirts of, of, the, uh, of Dachau, the concentration camp, um, there was a uh, about about, I think, almost 40 uh, carriages of a train, which was later known as the death train, and around about 2,000 dead bodies. And this was just outside the entrance to uh, KZ Dachau. And uh, when he came across this, this death train, he was very, very, um, I'd, I'd say that he was traumatized by the, the sight of 2,000 dead, rotting bodies. Uh, one, um, he went from boxcar to boxcar, um, the reaction of the men with him, he was actually leading from the front yet again. Uh, I Company from his regiment, um, he led I Company into the outskirts of Dachau that morning. And uh, the reaction of the men around him was, was varied. It was, it was almost as if someone had, had, had very close to them had died. Um, they experienced nausea. Sparks himself vomited um, for several minutes. Uh, many men cried, they collapsed in grief, uh, they were um, utterly bewildered. Sparks said to, to me that the scenes he came across that day at Dachau were beyond human reason, that you just couldn't ever imagine anything like this ever happening, that human beings could do this to other human beings was something that he just was, he, he, for the rest of his life, he couldn't understand how people could be that depraved and that inhuman. Um, so uh, the emotions, his emotion and the, men, the emotions of his men rapidly turned to anger. Um, Sparks himself tried to stay in control of his own emotions, although that, he told me that was difficult. But he admitted that he lost control of his men for maybe an, half an hour. And as they moved into the camp and saw thousands and thousands of dead, rotting bodies, you know, turning blue in the, in the uh, spring sun, um, his men became increasingly enraged and they were, um, they were 
hungry, hungry for vengeance. They got to the center of the uh, of Dachau, KZ Dachau, and this is the coal yard, as I mentioned. And the reason why it's empty is because they've used the Nazis, the SS rather, have used all the coal to incinerate as many bodies as they could. They didn't want to leave evidence behind, but they ran out of coal. Uh, and therefore, that's why you had several thousand carcasses uh, left out and uh, were you know, visible. Um, but the coal yard's empty. There's no coal there. And Sparks' men went into various buildings. There's a building behind the wall there, which has a big uh, red cross on it. And that was an infirmary. And that was an infirmary for, infirmary for not for KZ, KZ Dachau, the concentration camp, but for the larger complex that was called Dachau. The larger complex included uh, training facilities, uh, infirmary, dormitories, offices, quarters, etc. And in the infirmary, maybe about 100 yards beyond that wall, uh, Sparks' men found uh, several dozen uh, injured and wounded um, SS officers. Uh, now, these officers uh, were not men who had had carried out the atrocities at Dachau. They were not part of that wing of the SS. They were the Waffen SS, and many of them had served uh, on the Eastern Front. They were not uh, war criminals, as far as we know. Anyway, they were they were not the uh, the, the Death's Head Brigade that uh, committed the the, the Holocaust. Um, but anyway, they were lying in these beds. Uh, Sparks' men were absolutely disgusted that these guys could be lying there in clean white under clean white sheets while outside thousands had died. Um, and they kicked them out of the infirmary, put them into a group, and then they marched them into the coal yard here. And a guy called Lieutenant Walsh um, commanded maybe a dozen other guys from I Company. You'll see that there's a machine gunner down there just below Sparks. Uh, he's a 19 year old called Curtin. Um, and then Sparks was uh, um, asked to to leave the coal yard, uh, the Germans were left there under armed guard. They all had their hands in the air. Um, they'd been collected. They were, um, as far as Sparks knew, they were, um, they had been secured. And he went into a building uh, behind the wall, the, the, the coal yard wall there. And he told me that um, the building was full of dead bodies. It was like, literally he said, you, you couldn't fit a single extra dead body. And it was from the floor to the rafters. And uh, while he was there, he heard firing. And um, so he ran out of the building and he heard a, a, a machine gun. And that's the machine gun, the curtain there in the front of the picture, he fired. And then there were pistol shots, uh, carbine shots, and uh, Tommy gun shots. And what had happened is that Lieutenant Walsh from I Company, who, who Sparks had left in command guarding these, uh, these SS soldiers, he'd ordered the men to open fire. Um, we believe that at least a dozen were killed and maybe up to three dozen were, were badly wounded. Um, so this is, a, this is a scene that shows you what happened when Sparks ran back into the coal yard, saw what had happened, and then literally pulled his pistol out of his, out of his holster, fired it, and, uh, and, and stopped his men from carrying out this what can only be described as a, an atrocity. It was the cold-blooded killing, not cold-blooded, hot-blooded killing of, of SS soldiers within, within Dachau. Um, I think this is a very powerful image because it, there are very few times in a, in a human being's life, um, certainly this kind of American, when you can see the essence of someone's character, when you can see their, their purity and their integrity and who they really are. Um, and this is taken by a signal call photographer. It's part of actually of a, of a film. Uh, there were actually three or four other frames from the film that I could show you where you see that hand move from being straight up in the air and then to where it is right now. Um, and uh, it was discovered in the, um, long after the war, it was discovered actually in the early nineties by a, a researcher into the Holocaust a guy called David Israel. Um, and the Signal Corps cameraman had um, come back from Europe after the war. Like so many of the so-called gener greatest generation, he, he wanted to forget everything. He didn't want to revisit the memories. He didn't want to revisit what he'd seen that day, what he'd photographed that day. And he put the roll of film, the canister of film in his garage. He lived in New Jersey 
and um, he never opened it again. And then at a reunion of the uh, of the regiment, he met the researcher, and the researcher um, said, "You know, what what did you do in the war?" And he said, "Well, I." I, I followed the US troops as they liberated Europe. And then finally, he said, you know, uh, there's one day I'll never forget. There's one, one day above all that I will never, ever forget. It's seared in my mind. It's uh, imprinted on my memory forever. And that was uh, at Dachau. I was there. I, I was there when, um, I got to say, when, when we killed a bunch of SS guys and, uh, and I filmed it. And uh, David Israel, the researcher, said, well, have you got the film? And he said, well, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I just put it in my garage. I, I've never looked at it again, you know? So David Israel persuaded him to go into his garage, the, the, the Signal Corps cameraman, uh, and then send him uh, the undeveloped film. And this is, this is part of that film that was developed. Some of the, a lot of the, the, um, the negative, negatives had been destroyed or had worn away, but this part of the film, there were several frames like this had been preserved. Uh, and it's astonishing because, you know, this is over, over 40 years after the war, this, in, uh, this, this moment, this defining moment in Sparks' life is suddenly brought to vivid life. Now, the point of the story, the point, the reason why I'm talking about this at great length is because Sparks had lived under a shadow all through 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, there have been a lot of false accusations, a lot of Holocaust deniers had said that he, his, he and his men had massacred 500 SS at, uh, at Dachau. In fact, one of his own, one of his own um, uh, battalion medics um, had, 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 uh, had, had repeated that claim that they'd killed over 500 Germans at, at Dachau. Um, and so there had been a lot of rumor, a lot of suspicion. Had Sparks been a part of the massacre? Had he ordered the massacre? Um, was he guilty of, of uh, this crime against humanity, this, this atrocity that you're looking at here? Um, what, he, what exactly had he done? So at a reunion, David Israel uh, in the early 90s pulled out this photograph and several others and was with Sparks. By then in the early 90s, Sparks was a, uh, a general he was the commanding general of the Colorado National Guard. Um, he had uh, had many, many reunions and had brought together his men several times. And Israel pulled out the photograph. And the first thing that Sparks said was that, yeah, that's me because that's my map in my pocket. I always had my map in that pocket. And then Sparks broke down and he cried. And uh, Israel told me that he, he was very, very, very moved indeed because finally in front of him, was this visual evidence of him firing his gun, thrusting his hand out in the air and doing the right thing after this is, we think it could be his 501st day of, of war. Um, it's 29th of April, 1945. He has been in combat fighting, losing men since the 10th of July, 1943. Um, many, many men uh, that he loved, that he led, that um, he cared for very deeply were killed under his command. Uh, so he had every reason to despise the Germans. He had every reason in particular to really, really hate uh, anybody in an SS uniform. As I mentioned to you, his entire battalion had been surrounded and almost entirely wiped out just a few months before. But no, what does he do? Right at the end, he does the right thing. He does what a good officer would do. He does what a, a decent American, a decent working class American liberator we hope would do. And even though he's seen the worst things that you can possibly imagine, he has the decency to say, no, we don't do this. We did not come to Europe to do this. We are better than this. We are different. We have a different set of values. We don't kill people when they have their hands in the air. We're better than the enemy. Um, so it was a very important image in his life. It was one that showed you that shows you and showed everybody else that this is who he really was. Um, so I think I'm almost at the end now. I'm going to show you one. I know I'm probably banging on too much, but I wanted to show you just uh, one last image. Um, and here you go. That's him. So I showed you the photograph, the lower left photograph, my left anyway, of Sparks and his wife, Mary. And then you have sent a picture. You have Sparks there um, a few years before he died. And then Mary, his, his, um, 
his wife, who he finally held in his arms. If you watch the Netflix series, if you get to the fourth hour, I hope you do. Um, almost the very last scene of the, um, of the Netflix series shows you Sparks um, arriving in El Paso in the summer of 1945. Um, he had called Mary from the East Coast and said, uh, come to El Paso because I'm being stationed there for a while. Come and meet me and we can, we can get together. And I interviewed Mary several times and she said that she drove all the way from uh, Arizona as fast as she possibly could to uh, El Paso. And she got a room in a motel in El Paso. And it was, I think it was on the eighth or ninth floor. And she opened the windows and that very, uh, that very night, all of El Paso exploded because it was uh, VJ Day. It was the end of the war. It was the end of the, the that awful, awful, awful war in which almost 500,000 Americans laid down their lives. And she was alone um, in this hotel room waiting for her husband, hadn't seen him for more than two years. And then finally he arrived. And uh, if you, as I said, if you watch the Netflix show, they don't say anything because I asked her when they meet for the first time, they don't say anything. So I said, what did you do? What did, what did he say? You know, did he say, I, I love you? How's our son? I've not seen our son yet. And she said that he didn't say a word. Um, and in the show, you'll see that all they do is hug. They just, and I said, what happened? She said, we, we hugged for a very long time. Um, and that's actually in the, the Netflix show, which I really loved because it, it was a very moving, powerful end. Um, so Sparks, just to wrap up, he, he left the army. He went back to college, uh, went to college in Colorado, became a lawyer, became a very aggressive lawyer, a very successful lawyer, um, stayed in the National Guard, reconstituted the National Guard in Colorado, event eventually became the commanding general, general of, the, of the Colorado National Guard. He also was a, for a while, a Supreme Court justice in Colorado. He spent decades um, preserving and conserving the water sources for Colorado. If you happen to go to Colorado and turn on a tap, there's a very good reason why Coloradans can uh, control and, and uh, use their own resources. And that's be mainly because of uh, Sparks and others that made sure that uh, Colorado water supply was conserved for Colorado. And he um, died in 2007. He was uh, just uh, uh, arrived at his 90th birthday and died as a great um, Colorado hero and uh, a, a highly celebrated warrior from the Second World War, um, a man that spent 500 days um, liberating Europe from the very first day that Americans started to die. Um, over, some, I think around about 140,000 Americans died during the liberation of Europe. He was there on day one and there at the very, very end at, at, at Dachau when the, uh, and shortly after when the war ended. So I, I he's an amazing guy, very, um, very powerful story, very, very influential, uh, and uh, I was very lucky, very, very lucky indeed in my career to have been able to meet him and uh, and talk to him and tell his story. So thank you for listening. I hope I haven't banged on too long, um, but uh, it's great for you to have joined me yet again. Thank you very much. And thank you, Alex. Um, you certainly didn't go on too long. This was fascinating. Um, we have uh, some questions. Uh, did did Sparks have a happy post-war life? Uh, yeah, he did. Yeah, he. Um, um, well, I mean, does anybody have a happy life? <laughs> I mean, uh, there were losses. I mean, um, he. Yeah, I think that he. If I could reframe the answer, um, I I wondered just how badly he might have been affected by the war because you know you would expect him to have suffered pretty serious post-traumatic stress uh, disorder. It, it wasn't called that back then. Um, and he said there were a, a few occasions after the war when he was a bit jumpy. There was one time when he was out um, uh, hunting and he walked below some power lines and there was a sudden crack and, and buzzing. You know how you, that can happen sometimes. And he dived to the ground and curled up into a ball. Um, and so obviously there was a, a little bit of PTSD there a reaction to the sound of war, what he thought was war. But apart from that, very little um, that was as dramatic as that or that I know about. I mean, he, he wasn't the kind of guy that would say, yes, I was really messed up by the war. Um, he, he was 
he was a tough guy. He was a irascible, angry old dude a lot of his life, at, at the end of his life. Um, uh, I think he was profoundly affected by it. Um, and I know that because his grandson was killed in a drive-by shooting in the early 90s. And uh, it was as if these re the repressed survivor's guilt, the repressed trauma just suddenly exploded. It, the floodgates opened. Um, the death of his grandson and, um, really profoundly affected him. And I think that he grieved his grandson's death, his teenage grandson's death, but I think he was also grieving the, the enormous loss of life that he'd uh, endured as, a, as, a, as, a, as an officer during World War II. And he launched a campaign, a very successful campaign, a notable campaign, uh, to try and change the gun laws in Colorado because the, the young man who'd killed his grandson was uh, under the age of 18. And Sparks said, you know, this is crazy that, you know, whatever you think about gun laws, kids should not be able to kill other kids. They shouldn't be able to walk into a Walmart and buy a gun. A 16 shouldn't be able to legally buy any weapon. And he actually changed the laws in Colorado. The NRA opposed him fiercely, as you might imagine. And uh, he prevailed. He, um, he, uh, he managed to change the, the laws in Colorado so that to this day, you actually have to be, you know, 18 to be by a weapon. So yeah, um, he had a happy life. Yeah, his wife, they were very happily married to, to Mary for, I think it was almost, well, my God, he died in 2007. He was married in 1941. So it's an awful long time. Um, yeah, um, he, uh, he bore the emotional damage of war, which is inevitable. He bore it, he bore it with great dignity and very, very well. But he had a temper on him and didn't, so, didn't suffer fools gladly. And uh, I sometimes could be a little bit vociferous, you know, if he, uh, things didn't go as he planned. Okay, we have a um, sort of a comment, maybe a question here. Uh, someone said they visited Dachau, which is surrounded by factories in which the inmates were forced to work and seeing that always made her wonder about the response of the soldiers who heard from the citizens of the towns, town that they didn't know what was going on. Yeah, well, I think this is a, it's a very good point. Thank you for raising that because, um, when I went to Dachau, I, I went to the, I retraced Sparks' footsteps as much as I could. And the death train that I mentioned to you is right on the outskirts of the, of the complex. And the railway tracks, the railroad tracks are literally, are less than five yards from the front doors of a row of terraced um, housing. So any good German housefrau from 1933, which is when Dachau was opened, so to speak, it was the first concentration camp in Nazi Germany, less than two months after Adolf Hitler took power. Uh, it was a place where he assigned his political enemies. So from 1933 to 1945, you had trains pulling in in front of your house as you hung out the washing or cooked sauerkraut for 12 years. And so the, so the idea that you could pretend that you didn't know what was happening is, is absolute, it's ridiculous. Uh, that's just the, the trains pulling up yards in front of you, let alone the smell of the incinerator uh, that was burning bodies at the end, let alone the screams, the gunshots, the, the sound of, of well over 50,000 people dying. Uh, they mostly died of malnutrition and overwork, but many of them were executed. Uh, the idea that, that you didn't know what was going on is is um, is uh, laughable. Um, and those that argued that they didn't know what was going on were, were not believed. Um, so we have a few uh, comments, questions about the Netflix series. And, and I personally um, had, had sort of a question on that. How much involvement did you have in making of the film? And why was it made as an animated film? Um, I had absolutely no involvement at all. <laughs> the first time I saw it was on the 11th of November. I sat down with my wife and I thought, oh my God, what are they, what are they going to do to my book? <laughs> Especially, as you say, because it was animated. Um, I was like, oh my God, an animated, you know, my, turning my book into a cartoon for four hours? Like a 50 minute cartoon might be endurable, but four hours? Um, um, no, I, I've, um, you know, I don't want to sound jaundiced or, uh, but I, I've been around various Hollywood people for a long time. And I, 
learned that basically they don't really want to hear from people like me. They they want to go and have their own, do their own thing, have their own vision and their own creative vision, most importantly. Uh, the guy that wrote this is a guy called um, Jeb Stewart. He adapted my book and he, very, very good writer. I'm not just saying that, but I actually was very pleased with what he did. And he's the guy behind, um, you know, Die Hard, The Fugitive. He's now the... Um, the, uh, the lead creator for a new Viking series for the History Channel. He knows what he's doing. He's, he's long in the tooth. And uh, I said to the producers, you know, really early on, I said, look, if you want any help, if you want any advice, just here's my phone number, just call me. I, I never got a call, but I did get a check, which is more important. And uh, I was I was like, you know, I was really delighted. I, I was very nervous when I watched it. Um, but I was actually really pleased. And I, there was, obviously, the certain liberties were taken, but essentially, the, the essential emotional journey of Sparks, uh, the way that you end up feeling about him and his men and his relationship with his wife, and the way that you empathize with him and the way that you really understand the trauma that he went through and the loss, it's all there. And I, I think they managed that, that very well. I think that was, um, it was really true to the emotional arc of his journey in World War II. Um, as for the animation, um, it's very expensive to, to, to make four hours of a war movie. There literally aren't the tanks anymore to put on a battlefield so you can recreate that. Um, it probably cost, I don't know, I, I don't know the exact figures, but it was probably at least a third of the cost of, of doing it in the way that, say, Band of Brothers was done. Um, and the idea being is that, you know, that the, the trioscope technology they used, they had actors against the green screen in the studio in Poland. And they would, and then what they would do is they would uh, animate their faces, paint in their faces, but the background, the, the battle scenes, the, the vast vistas, some of them really beautiful. In fact, the Riper's Violet episode, episode three, where they, they really brought the Vosges to, to a magnificent life. Um, that was done by, by traditional animation. So what you had is live action, but pace, faces, painted and, uh, and, and animated, but this ability to be able to put actors, real actors against this really beautiful backdrops, this, these, these images that would have been just hugely expensive to do otherwise. So in a way that, you know, I, I thought it was very interesting and it was very, it was sometimes very, really, really beautiful. Um, some things didn't work for me, but a lot of it really did. And I, I'm just glad they made it. You know, I, I've, um, I've written way too many books. I, I think this, that was my, you know, I think I've written 10 books I shouldn't have written. Uh, um, and most of them, all but, all but a couple have been optioned by Hollywood. Uh, people like Michael Mann, Tom Cruise, other names involved over the years. And I was always sitting there praying and praying and praying that they would actually one day make something. So I think I was ma mainly just believed that finally um, someone had actually decided to um, put something on a screen somehow. Um, and they did. I think they did a really, really nice job. I was. I'm very proud of it. Do you? Was there anything that you felt like they stretched the truth, or um, that you you were not happy with? Um, no. Uh, the, the what was interesting was that um, I think that what I was pleased about as as much as the the writing by Jeb Stewart was the fact that they they created two composite characters. Um, so the Native American, there were three main characters, Sparks, the Liberator, and then two other guys that you follow pretty much to the end. And one of them is a, a Native American, and one of them is a Mexican American. And I thought that was really interesting and it was refreshing and it got a lot of news, a lot of um, national media really picked up on that. And I think what was great about it, coming off the back of you know Black, Black Lives Matter and the the traumatic and summer of term turmoil that we had went through last summer uh, was that the Liberator therefore um, shows a, a diverse uh, face, a, a, a not, not just a white face of American victory and liberation in World War II. It shows a, um, a truthful um, image of the, the diversity of American forces in World War II. We had, it wasn't just white boys uh, winning defeating Nazism, in the Thunderbirds case, it was a hell of a lot of Native Americans, warriors, true warriors, um, who, whose uh, 
tribes had undergone horrific genocide three or four generations before that actually liberated places like Dachau and defeated fascism. So I, I really enjoyed that. I, I thought it was really um, timely and it was about, it was long overdue to start showing that, you know, women, blacks, minorities, you name it, they, they all played their part. They, they were not fighting for the same causes, all of them, but they were, they were all fighting for their idea of what America should be, could be, or was. They were, Native Americans were fighting for their, the, the people that they grew up with on their reservation. Mexican Americans were fighting for the people from their, their poor towns in New Mexico, etc. They were fighting for their communities that were still American, uh, even though they had different images of visions of what America should be or could be. Um, and in the case of blacks, obviously, uh, couldn't even vote. Um, and were disenfranchised and, and suffered terrible uh, racism and segregation. Um, I, I, I saw, I watched the entire uh, series and I thought it was very well done. And I, and I actually found oh, the, the animation, I, I thought the animation uh, was very effective um, in, in there. I'm just curious, has, has, has everybody seen the film? I think it's well worth it. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see here. Oh, we have, I mean, um, Steve Sending, you had a comment here, question. I, I'm, I'm not sure I understand what you're asking. Maybe you could unmute yourself and. Yeah, um, can you hear me? Yes. At the end, um... Toward the end, you were saying that uh, as you were talking about Sparks' uh, heroicism at Dachau, um, firing his pistol in the air and stopping the slaughter, you said we were better than this. And I thought to myself, in light of what happened on January 6, 2021, are we still? Oh my God. <laughs> well, you know, if I, if I was my normal self and I had a hangover and was somewhat irritable about the way that things have gone in the last four years under the, the last president, I, I might answer that with a little bit more bite and honesty, but um, I take your point. Um, I, I, if you want me to be absolutely honest, I think that what we saw on January the 6th would have made Spark would, would have certainly have made Sparks and a lot of those guys turn in their graves, that they were fighting to defeat exactly what was we saw spewing across our national capital in, on January the 6th. Um, idiocy, fascism, Nazism, the worst strain of American life, I believe. I mean, not, not deplorable, but enormously beyond deplorable. Um, and that's what happens. Yes. That's what, that's what happens when you allow, I'm sorry, but when you allow social media to, to be unfettered and when you turn, turn a, a blind eye to, to um, neo-Nazism and, um, and uh, fascism. Um, it's, uh, humanity will always disappoint if you allow it to behave very badly indeed and you don't set political and social and moral norms and don't expect people to behave themselves. In a, in a civilized society, there are standards. And unfortunately in America, way too many people made way too much money. I'm talking about Fox News and CNN and Mark Zuckerberg at Facebook, et cetera, out of the Trump presidency. Um, you know, they enabled him. They created a reality TV president. And look what, it, look what we ended up with. Complete uh, a national trauma of uh, that I'm still trying to get over. <laughs> um, Ed Morrow, do you have a question? Yes. Uh, Thank you, Alex. Uh, yes, I just, uh, can you hear me? Yes, Ed, yeah. go ahead. I yeah, I just wanted to comment that uh, I, I agree with uh, with uh, both Alex and and uh, Steve, um, the reaction, we are better than this, but the parallel for me is, um, that the the people who who uh, invaded the capital uh, were being spoken to by uh, 
by this great leader, by, by, by leaders who say we are better than this. So this, this duality is, has existed throughout our history. And, yeah. Uh, no, I, I agree. Um, what disturbs me is that I don't know how many tens of millions, even, even after four years, were prepared to vote for him again. And if it hadn't been for COVID, we'd be into our fifth year of the Trump presidency. That's disturbing. Um, we, the bottom line is that we have an enormous amount of work to do in terms of educating people about fascism, about what, you know, the proudest chapter in American history, I believe, as a European, um, is, is World War II, is what, particularly what was done in Europe. Um, Europe today exists it, 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 as it does because of the sacrifice of so many, and all those wonderful Americans. Um, and they, they damn well knew what they were fighting against and what they were fighting for. They, they absolutely knew. Um, this was no Vietnam, this was World War II. Um, so I, we've got a lot of work to do in terms of Holocaust education, in terms of basic civics and, and making people understand what democracy is about, uh, why you can't be racist, why it's wrong to be racist, what, what, these, what pressing these buttons leads to, what it's led to in the past and what it will lead to again. You don't incite people um, through Twitter or whatever to, to be their worst selves. And that's what he did. For four years, he incited Americans to be their worst selves, not their better selves. Great presidents, Roosevelt, Kennedy, there have been many, thank God. Lincoln, a great president makes Americans better than themselves. What brings out the best in a country, unites that country, importantly, against great challenges, and then brings out the virtues, the, 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 the better side, the better angels in us. And he didn't do that, he did the opposite. Can I ask you a question? Uh, can anybody hear me? Can you hear yes, me? Yes, Barry, Barry, go ahead. Yeah. Um, when they came upon DACO, was this a target where they, they knew they were going to this place or they so, just came upon it? In other words, during the course of the campaign, was one of the objects to, to come to DACO, DACO? Did they know what was happening beforehand? Uh, or they just no. came upon it? Uh, come yeah. Upon it. Great, great question. And this is why they were so traumatized by it, is because they, they had no idea what a concentration camp was. Uh, Sparks, you know, he had an order to go and, and liberate a, a place in Dachau. Uh, he didn't know what that place was. And several of his men actually believed that they were going to go and liberate a, a prisoner of war camp. They didn't, they didn't know what a concentration camp was. Um, so the, 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 the impact on them was enormous because they, they had never imagined that, 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 what, that this could happen, that people could do this. And they were looking at a concentration camp for the very first time. And it was, I mean, Sparks, I won't go on too long, but Sparks had said to me that, you know, these guys, these guys had seen everything you could possibly see in a war. And that, that's, those are things that I can't talk about because they're so, they're so traumatizing and, and, and debased in terms of disfigurement, dismemberment, a death, et cetera. But they'd never seen anything like they saw that day on the 29th of April, 1945. It was the level of inhumanity. It was the it was the acceptance that took. I don't think they accepted it that day, and I don't think many. I don't think a lot of them could ever really come to accept that level of evil. Um, and I think we can use absolute terms like good and evil when it comes to moments like this. You know, Sparks and his men were essentially good, and. Um, that what they were defeating was essentially evil. I, I, I'll, I'll mention one quote um, that I always sticks in my mind, and I, I use it in a, to start a chapter in the book. And it's by a Frenchman, which you know you have to be somewhat suspicious when a Frenchman makes a makes a statement of uh, a, a definitive statement about anything. But, uh, <laughs> um, but like he that. said that you know the the, the forces of near. Uh, of, of near perfect evil were defeated by the forces of uh, almost perfect, not almost perfect, but, but by goodness. Near perfect evil was defeated by, by um, goodness, flawed goodness. You know, um, uh, goodness with scars and, uh, and problems and wounds, but an, an essential decency defeated evil in World War II. That's why I write about it. I'm not interested in any other war. I'm not interested in 
Vietnam or Iraq or Afghanistan, the First World War. This, this is a, you know, there's a certain moral clarity to what happened, certainly in Europe, maybe not so much the Pacific, but certainly in Europe, and especially if you're an, a European that spent most of their adult life in America, it's something that I hold on to, that I, I, I revere and treasure because it connects me to America and it connects me to Europe. And I've, I've been incredibly lucky to be able to spend over 20 years now, mostly talking to, to Americans that went and liberated a, a, a place that I grew up, that I love and is, is, is democratic and free and, and, and really beautiful and civilized. Can I ask a question? Sure. Um, Who is that? Linda Thompson. Okay. Yes. <laughs> I was just wondering, how do you know how long that they stayed at Dachau? Once um, they yeah, very good question. Um, Sparks only Sparks set up his command post that night, so the headquarters for the regiment was actually in the Dachau camp that night. Um, but then he moved on because you have to remember that these guys they had a war to finish. The 29th of April was about almost a week before the end of the war. Uh, they had to liberate Munich, and then they had to push on. So uh, he spent that night there, and what happened was that we brought in as many medics, medi as many nurses, and as much food and medicine as we possibly could. And they set up a, uh, a hospital uh, within, within outside Dachau at first because it had to be quarantined, and then within Dachau itself. So um, the actual liberators, the guys with Sparks, they moved on, and they were in Munich by... The, um, on the 30th of April. Um, in fact, one of the guys I interviewed for the book, um, he set up the headquarters for the regiment, for Sparks and the other guys, at the Hofbrau House. And I, I, I don't know whether you've been to Munich, but the Hofbrau House is the famous uh, Hofbrau House where Hitler had his 1923 Beer Hall Putsch. Um, the capital attack in Munich happened on the, in 1923. Um, but very symbolic place to set up the headquarters of an American liberating unit that had, had uh, been in combat from the very first day that we began to try and restore democracy and humanity to Europe. And uh, the guy was called Ant Spears. Um, he was in C Company of the 157th Infantry Regiment. And uh, there's a photograph you can find on Google. And he chalked, with chalk, he put right above the entrance, the famous entrance to the Hofbrau House, he chalked HQ 157 uh, right above the entrance, which is, I think it's just super cool. It's, it's, it's fantastic. You know, you can't, you can't make this stuff up, but, uh, but to, yeah, that's where they, and they, they, a lot of the, all the beer had gone, but they had lots of the beer steins in the basement. And uh, what's remarkable is that um, the, um, the level of fraternization among Americans uh, at, the end of, at the end of the war in May of 1945 was astonishing. Um, Sparks actually boasted about it later on after the war. He said, I was really proud of my guys. The, the amount of German girls they started to date, was, it was incredible. Um, so this goes back to this idea of, uh, you know, you've been through hell, you've been fighting the Germans for years, and then within a couple of weeks at the end of the war, you, 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 you're um, umpiring with grandpa in, in a village in Bavaria and, and dating his daughter and drinking beer steins and, and marrying them. And they had, actually had cases where the GIs married German girls uh, in Munich at, uh, at the end of the war. Um, uh, they just, there was not that residual, there was no residual real hatred. Uh, I, it's not like in the Pacific. Um, and uh, they sent inspectors to, to Munich. Um, word got out that all these GIs were dating German girls because you were not supposed to do that. That was absolutely verboten. You know, they had signs everywhere saying that, you know, to kiss a German girl was to kiss the devil. Um, they didn't want any kind of, you know, it was really strict. Um, and the GI said, we don't care. You know, this is one, one guy wrote a, uh, I, I came across a really beautiful memoir. It was. Part, badly written in parts, but sometimes really powerful and really, really um, evocative. It was never published. It was a guy called Cundiff who was in the Thunderbird Division. And he said that the best expression of American democracy that he'd seen in his entire life was what happened when Americans started dating German girls a week after the end of the war in Germany in 1945. It was like the perfect, the perfect example of what democracy at its best 
at its most inspiring should be as a GI with a, 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 an American girl in his arms in a nightclub drinking beer and dancing to black jazz music, you know, it's sort of beautiful. <laughs> uh, let's see here. A question, uh, World War II always raises the question why, why did the Holocaust happen? Why did the German people go along with the Nazis even when they were not Nazis? Why weren't the survivors who escaped and tried to inform the world about what was occurring not listened to? Why didn't we bomb the railway lines going to the concentration camps? Why, why, why? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I won't get on my political hobby horse again, but um, if you want to, one answer, that, one, one answer to that could be, when you put children in cages on the border and then another four, four, three or four years later, 70 million people vote, for the same guy again, um, you you can understand that uh, people can be easily led um, and influenced. So um, I could go on for a long time, but um, uh, you know, democracy is a very precious thing. It's very valuable and it's very fragile. It's only existed for a short, very short period in human history, um, and certainly um, in Europe, it's been. Uh, under threat and has been destroyed over and over again. Um, we have to make sure that we are very vigilant about, about knowing what democracy means, about being uh, destroying all forms of racism, because fascism, uh, Nazism was uh, basically a racist ideology. The, um, I'll, end, I'll end with this in terms of answering the question. Yes, we should have bombed the rail yards. There was no, no, no question. We, we bombed we bombed factories not that far from Auschwitz, so we could have bombed Auschwitz itself. And uh, Holocaust survivors that I've met said that, you know, even if they'd been in Auschwitz and their fam they and their families had been killed, so what? They would have, it would have been a symbolic blow. May not have stopped the killing, but I think in 19, late 1944, towards the end of the war, certainly Auschwitz, if you'd flattened it, it would have, it would have made a difference. Um, but I remember interviewing a guy who, um, survived the Holocaust. He and his wife survived the Holocaust. They were um, in Hungary. Um, they were in Budapest, actually. They were both saved by Raoul Wallenberg, who in the Guinness Book of Records is the one man in history who saved more lives than any other during the Holocaust. Some people say that it was 50, 60,000 people in Hungary. Some say well over 100,000. They both received Schutz passes, safe passes from Wallenberg. And I went to uh, interview this survivor, and he was in uh, Ottawa. It was extremely cold. It was in the winter. And um, I had a beer with him, and he pulled up his sleeve, and he showed me um, uh, his mus the muscle on his forearm. And he said, you know, Alex, uh, two things I want to tell you right now. Number one, the power of love is you can never conquer it. You, people might die, but you can never kill love. And he told me about one time when he'd had, uh, in Budapest, when the Arrow Cross, who were uh, the same kind of breed, I will say, as launched the capital attack, they were incited, they were viciously racist, but they were very well armed. Um, and they murdered tens of thousands of Jews in, in 1944, 1945. And uh, they came into a safe house that Wallenberg had created. And um, the guy that I interviewed held up his, uh, his young wife in an air passage for about two or three hours with his, with his one hand. And when I interviewed him, he held out his arm and he tensed his muscles and he said, you know, you know what it feels like to hold up the body weight of someone that you love for two or three hours and if you drop them, they'll fall eight floors. Um, it's incredible what you can do when you, when you are in, when you're, when you're in, when you love. Um, and then the flip side of that is I, it was that, you know, I asked him, how could fascism exist? How could they, end up with, with over 6 million Jews killed? How could they commit those atrocities? How could they hate so much? And he said, for someone to be loved, i.e. for Hitler to be loved, you can replace Hitler with other names, somebody has to be hated. So the more you dial up the hatred of others, the other, the Mexican immigrant, the, the, the black, the Hispanic, the, the stranger, the, the non-white Republican, as long as you can dial that up, then that means that they, the love that comes back to the 
dictator or the leader is only increased. And I thought that, and he was a psychiatrist. He spent most of his career, 40 years as a psychiatrist. So he understood human nature. And I thought that was very, a very important lesson. When you start to, to, to dehumanize people, when you treat them as other, as not like yourself, not human, um, all sorts of horrible things tend to follow from that. And we saw it in less than four years. We saw how, how debased American political culture became in just four years um, because of people pointing fingers and making others uh, less human than the so-called white majority. Okay. Um, there's one last question here. Were you underestimating the accuracy of allied bombs in, a, in a, something you were saying a little bit earlier? Um, well, Andrew Riley, would you want to, <laughs> do you want to <laughs> unmute and the, um, hang on. Well, at least part of the problem of bombing Auschwitz was whether or not you're going to bomb the prisoners because the accuracy was so low. Yeah, I agree with you, but um, I guess my answer to that would be that you know uh, if you can kill if you can kill one hundred twenty thousand people, civilians, in one night in Tokyo, which we did in early nineteen forty five through firebombing, so we killed in one night in Tokyo um, more than we killed in Hiroshima and Nagasaki put together uh, in firebombing, traditional firebombing, strategic so called strategic bombing, then. I, you could make the moral argument that as long as you destroyed Auschwitz, who cared who was in there? Because, and by that, what, I, what I mean by that is that Auschwitz, in, in less than two months in the summer of 1944, over 500,000 Hungarian Jews were murdered. That was, I think it's one every two seconds. So if you just flattened the place, you may have saved a lot more. Maybe there were 50,000 people in there. Maybe there were 20,000. You could have saved possibly a lot more lives by just, just destroying the place. Um, a very difficult moral calculation to make. Um, you know, this is an endless debate that whether we should have bombed Auschwitz or not is, a, is an endless debate. I personally believe that we should have, we should have. Um, I think history would have looked a lot kinder on uh, the allies uh, if we had, um, but you know, the, the, those targets, the argument made after the war and actually during the war by people like Eden in Britain was that, yes, this was a terrible thing, but we had a war to win. The, the concentration camps were a lesser priority. We, we had to defeat, first of all, Germany, and then we had Nazi Germany, then we had to go and defeat the Japanese in the Pacific, and we had to get that done as fast as possible with the minimum cost in American lives. And that's what, what we did. That's what, but that's what was achieved. So... Um, diversions from that, uh, they argued, were, you know, sorry, but we had a war to win. I don't actually believe that it, I don't buy that, to be honest, but it was the argument made at the time. But it's not true, though, because the policy decisions, they wouldn't let the Jews come sure. here. Yeah. It was just the same racism thinly disguised here. Yeah. And in England, too, you know, it's, you know, no, I, I mean, yeah. <laughs> I went to, I did a talk in uh, New Jersey uh, about, I don't know, 10 years ago, and I didn't realize that half the audience were um, people that survived the DP camps and most of their families had been wiped out during the Holocaust. And when we started getting onto these questions, people were just literally like screaming at me. And not that they, were, they didn't have anything against me personally, but just because we were talking about it, there was so much anger and rage and resentment and saying, you know, people still... There are still lots of people in, in America that will not have, never forgive, forgive Roosevelt because they think he didn't do enough. And, you know, I don't know, maybe they're right, maybe they're wrong, but the, it's still a very touchy subject. You know, it's very, um, it's very touchy, especially when you look at the quotas in the 1930s when, you know, we, 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 we knew that Hitler was a, a, a vile anti-Semite. Um, uh, so, yeah. It's not like he hid that. It's all in his book, right? I mean, he tells you everything he's going to yeah. do. Yeah, he didn't, he, didn't, he didn't say he was going to kill uh, six million Jews in his book, but he, it was pretty clear that he, uh, that, that the very last, his very, Hitler's very last words um, before he commits suicide were, were a screed against uh, uh, the Jewish, Jewish people. I mean, he, that, the last thing that he put to paper was a rant against, uh, was a warning to the world about the, the Jewish 
Jewish race. So absolutely, completely obsessed. There's only probably only one thing that was consistent in his, you know, sewered mind, and that was anti-Semitism, um, racism, which brings us back to more recent events. You know, racism is something that is just it's just so potent. It's it, we have to be constantly vigilant. Um, who would have thought what happened happened? It's we yeah again we're taken by surprise. You know, we we think that people are better than they are. And, they need to be constantly, sorry, they need to be constantly, constantly educated about why racism is so wrong, especially in America with its its history of the Civil War and segregation. And you know, it's you know, th th this country has to has to has to get over racism as as much as we it, it needs to be a very concerted fight all the time. Mm -hmm. Like there's such a tendency to just say the other, the the, the yeah. them and us. You know, and Mexican, they're not Mexican one rapists. of us, they're the other. <laughs> you know, th th let's not forget this guy started his, the guy that we should not mention because we shouldn't be mentioning him anymore because he's already ghosted us for four years and traumatized us for four years. But let's not forget that he he, he, he entered the political spotlight by claiming that our, one of our greatest presidents was not born in America, that he was an other. He was a, let alone... He was black. He didn't, you know, he couldn't go quite that far. But by maintaining that he wasn't an American, wasn't born in America, that that's the start. It was it, it, very clear what he was about. I think from the very beginning. Okay, we we this is this can probably go on forever, <laughs> um, but we are running out of time. And so, um, I, I'd to all like... those Republicans out there, please do not buy my book. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so um i want to thank thank you <laughs> I, I i want to say one thing that i failed to mention that tonight's program was sponsored by the keelan family foundation so a thank you to don and Veryl keelan for their support we we rely on uh support like that to help uh run our programs um i'd like to thank you alex um my pleasure for a fascinating fascinating talk um and let everybody know that he has another book coming out hopefully um october november and we certainly will invite him back and hope hopefully we can have him back in person and that would be that would be such a thrill um i'd let i would recommend to everybody that you go to netflix and watch the uh the liberator if you haven't already um and after you see The Liberator, then I'm going to ask you to go to the Manhattan Short Film Festival and buy your ticket online with Manhattan Short. I watched it last night and it was gripping and emotional. And um, the, these short films from around the world are just amazing. So I hope you'll support them. Um, happy anniversary to you. Alex and your wife. <laughs> she's, and, she's in the back of the room, she's saying, looking up. Yes, I know. We gotta hurry it up. <laughs> no, it's been wonderful. Um, you, 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 you guys are awesome. You're really awesome. It's a it's a thrill to have you with us. And um I want to just thank everybody for being with us here tonight. Um have a good night and we'll see you hopefully next at the next lecture. <laughs>